1980s. Uh, I am a former banker, so this particular subject is very near and dear to my heart. And I was a commercial banker uh, from the mid 70s to the mid 80s. Um, and so I have this kind of connection with community investment in banks. And I'm from LA and a low income community, you know, all that bells and whistles to go along with that. So um, today's speaker to me is kind of in my wheelhouse in my space. So I, you know, I'm a junkie for this kind of stuff. <laughs> uh, so our today's speaker, uh, Marisu Baradaran, is a professor at the uh, University of California at Irvine Law School. Um, previously to that, she was the Robert Colton Austin Chair in Corporate Law and the Associate Dean for Strategic Initiatives with a focus on diversity, inclusion, uh, and, and national and international faculty scholarship recognition while at the University of Georgia Law School. Uh, she's an author. We've talked about the book, one of the books, put it that way. Uh, and these books have been chronicled in all major publications. Uh, I think I've heard the one of the podcasts on one of the NPR uh, podcasts that she did. The other book that she has is The Color of Money, Black Banks and the Racial Wealth Gap. Um, she's also advised U.S. Senators and Congress on policies that involved um, this kind of forum that what do we do as public agencies and departments like the U.S. Treasury or the World Bank even attached to this issue of disparity, which I simplistically put it is that those who have get and those who don't usually don't. Uh, she has earned a bachelor's degree cum laude from Brigham Young University and her law degree is from uh, NYU. With that, I will turn it over to our speaker. Um, thank, thank you so much for, for having me. Do, do you, um, uh, will there be, is someone going to question me or do you want me to just talk first? You, and you we'll can kind of do an overview and talk and then we have a few yes. okay, questions, perfect. but I think you have enough content that uh, will cover yeah. our questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, you know, the, the basic, you know, uh, thesis of um, my research, and I, I didn't um, actually intend this to be the, the thesis. I thought I was, I would go a different direction, but I, uh, this is what, what, what I found is that, you know, a lot of the um, uh, efforts that the uh, policymakers, local, state, and national, especially federal, have um, advanced toward, you know, closing the racial wealth gap and sort of uh, advancing economic justice have been um, uh, what I call, uh, you know, decoy programs, not meaningful reforms. And there has been this, you know, continued um, uh, push to uh, uh, bolster up these uh, sort of symbolic and, uh, uh, you know, not particularly effective programs. Um, though, of course, they, you know, there is some good, they're not, you know, uh, as, as, as bad as, you know, what, uh, what things were, but basically the programs that I'm talking about, you know, opportunity zones and um, things that are just technical assistance to minority firms, these were all hatched in the Nixon administration um, during, you know, to, to cut down actual claims for meaningful economic redress. So that would in, be either, you know, uh, reparations or um, uh, some sort of uh, integration that was proposed at the time, either of those things, um, Nixon was unwilling to consider and with his economic advisors, including you know Alan Greenspan, um, Milton Friedman, and other uh, you know we call conservative neoliberal um, uh, thinkers, um, really crafted this program with, which they called uh, Black Capitalism, and it continues today in a lot of the you know what you see in the Reagan administration and and the Clinton administration through the um, uh, uh, Office of uh, Minority Business, which was a Nixon thing, is now that um, a Minority Business Development Agency and other things, and and really, um, you know, I, I there's nothing that uh, in in these in these agencies that is harmful or um, uh, bad, and I I think that you know there's there's a lot of, uh, to support, but these were all sort of it was an anemic response to one of the biggest uprisings in the in the century and uh, a real solid demand for justice that he really quickly um, and easily diverted um, through these programs. And so I, I tell that story, and you know, there's, there's a lot of that history that leads up to that point. 
um, which is also, you know, I talk about reconstruction where the same thing happened, um, you know, post reconstruction where uh, land was owed, was deserved and was um, sidelined uh, because of economic reasons that they, you know, needed uh, sharecropping to keep growing that cotton and to keep it at a low price. Instead, um, freedmen and women got a bank. And this bank, you know, Freedman's Bank is, is it was fine. Again, there's nothing uh, against these, these institutions, but it was a decoy from what really should have happened. And so my, my, the thesis in the book is to, you know, as, as these, there's these pivot points where there are demands for economic justice. And, and often at each time we've had them historically, and I trace a couple, you, you have this diversion into um, market capitalism, but not a real market capitalism, right? Because market capitalism doesn't discriminate. It protects property under the law. It is, you know, equal. And uh, it's just more capitalist theory and capitalism as fig leaf. Um, I am neither, you know, uh, against or pro uh, capitalism. It is just not the economic order that we have had in the United States. You cannot call what we've had capitalism, especially when you look at um, the race um, disparities and the absolute um, uh, prohibition of uh, markets uh, entry for uh, black men and women in skilled trades in you know their property not being protected by the law. So we we don't have capitalism because we haven't protected uh, black property. We have not allowed um, free entry into skills. We have not given the funds that were, you know, uh, uh, necessary for goods that were produced by um, these communities. So uh, that's that's the the sort of bulk of what I'm trying to say in the book. There's a lot of examples in there. I'm probably um, oversimplifying it <laughs> um, uh, in, in, in a large way, but that's basically the bulk of it. And, and so I, I push for toward the end, you know, um, really I'm not proposing some plan or uh, uh, thing, but I'm just kind of trying to warn um, uh, policymakers uh, uh, to not fall for these kind of um, decoy programs anymore and to really push for actual meaningful reform, which requires getting to the root of the problem, which is exclusion from wealth building um, credit products and uh, grants that were given to white communities from the beginning founding of this country until today. And it is not, you know, more or better, it is e equal. And to achieve equal, uh, you, you actually have to look at um, capital. And uh, we, we have not done that. We've tried to do uh, justice on the cheap and it doesn't work. Well, and one of the things that I saw and, and was just marveled at and how the, the research that you did and some of the, even the information that I, we didn't know of, or I didn't know of, I'll put it that way. I, as I was saying to Robin, when I first started, I, I was listening to the book Audible, Audible on Audible through, in my car. And I got so angry that I had to stop listening to it in my car because it wasn't safe for me to drive. And then I had to get it uh, in, in the book form and then hard carving. So with that, um, I, I do want to commend you on that because some of the things, it just seems to, me, seems to me, the amount of effort that went into to prevent is just outrageous to me. And then Michael, I'm sure you have your take and have some questions that you would ask, the, you know, like to direct us to, but um, what are some of the myths and realities in creating wealth in today's economy? that you, from all your research uh, for a direction for us. Yeah, yeah. so I will say that I was also shocked by the research, I, um, especially uh, the Nixon stuff. I, I knew sort of what I would find uh, in the New Deal era stuff with the redlining. I was familiar with that from previous work. Um, seeing the maps and seeing the actual, um, uh, the way that they coded these programs. I actually taught a class in this yesterday, just teaching redlining. And you just go, if you go, there's this website called Mapping um, Inequality uh, it's by Richmond University. And you can look at the actual um, maps that the, the HOLC used in 1934 to redline certain neighborhoods. And you can look at the factors that they use. So we just, as a class, I picked a, a random neighborhood in LA and it basically said, you know, there are basically black people living here and Mexicans and too many subver of the subversive races, li literally, and therefore it is redlined. You know, and redlining meaning no, no credit guarantees, no FHA mortgages, and 
for a century almost. Uh, and, and those effects are still being told. So I, I, I suspected that I, I knew what, what it was gonna look like. I didn't expect it to be so obvious and so blatant. And then same with the Nixon stuff. I spent a bunch of time in the Nixon archives. It's in your Belinda here. Um, and I didn't live in California at the time. So I you know, flew, flew there a couple of times. Um, and you know, the, the, the um, um, explicit way that Nixon talks to his advisors, Greenspan and others, and how um, just phenomenally racist and how how crafted these programs were. They, this was not an accident. This was how do we um, how do we stop what the civil rights groups are asking for without seeming like we're doing that. I mean, clearly he's he was not going to adopt any of their policies, but he also didn't want to seem to be, you know, uh, uh, as as uh, uh, dramatic as George Wallace. Um, so he had to find this way around it and really well-crafted program. So I think the myths are um, that, cap that capitalism exists. I think the myth is that um, wealth is created through hard work and savings. It is not. Wealth is created, it was created through FHA mortgages. It was created through Homestead Acts. It was created um, through owning you know, uh, slaves. It was created through um, uh, transfers from one generation to another and property. And those avenues were perpetually blocked um, to black property owners and black business uh, men and women. And again, they were blocked explicitly. This was not, oh, just soft racism. It was explicit um, blocks. And, and so that's the story I tell. And, and I think probably the reason some of this has not uh, been told is that a lot of it was found in bank archives. And I think a lot of people, this is, you know, I focus in banks and, and credit. And so I, I'm not a, uh, a, a racial justice scholar. I, you know, I wish I was, but I'm, I, my expertise is in, in banking and, and credit. And I meant to tell a bank and credit story. And this is what I um, found in there. And, and um, I think there has been a, 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 a revival of historians looking into finance. But at the time I started writing this book, like 10 years ago, there weren't that many. The last person though, there's two black economists who I should credit who have done this work a little bit. Um, but they were busy doing a, a lot of other things. 1936, Abram Harris, who wrote and um, The Negro as Capitalist, uh, was the last book about uh, basically black um, business and it, it's very thin and he just goes through a couple of um, banks and their balance sheets. So that was, you know, he was the first black economist at um, Chicago, a really, really brilliant um, economist that has, sort of has not been written into the history of economics at all. Um, and then the second was um, uh, uh, Brimmer, Andrew Brimmer, who was the first uh, African-American Fed Federal Reserve um, president um, appointed by Johnson who as soon as Nixon uh, unrolled his black capitalism program, Brimmer is a really brilliant economist and he was just, did the math. He was at the Fed at the time. He's like, this is, this is he's, he called it snake oil. Don't buy it. And um, really, uh, you know, is a, is a, he's a, you know, soft-spoken leader. He wasn't, but, but a really brilliant guy. He took his case to, to you know, Ebony even. He, he took it to Congress and was, you know, ignored. There's a couple ideas that Brimmer ha had at the time in the 1960s and 70s that he's, he's since been vindicated on, not just on this stuff, but a lot of Fed, Fed policy. You know, he was one, one of the people that warned against you know, derivatives and the risks that would build up. I feel like a part of the consequence of uh, you know, racism is that we actually didn't listen to some of, some of these really brilliant um, uh, economists uh, who um, you know, uh, were sidelined. He, he, you know, son of a sharecropper and graduated from Harvard uh, um, from, with a PhD in, uh, in economics. And, you know, I just think like, you know, I, I wish I'd heard of him before as, as someone who studies economics and finance and knows about all the Fed chairs. I had never heard of Andrew Brimmer until I started doing this research. And I, uh, it's, it's stunning actually that he had, he had been written out of that. Wow. Michael, do you have mm -hmm. questions? Mm -hmm. uh, Marissa, let me um, ask in this vein. So, I mean, you really lay out in your book this, I don't know if you call it bait and switch, but maybe the too harsh a way to put it on, but it has those mm -hmm. kind of things. Look over here where we go over to the other side and pick your pocket, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, today, there's a lot of discussion about community development financial institutions as the somewhat the holy grail of solving this problem. And my organization used to have a CDFI status 
we could never win a no I take the back. I did get one award from Treasury for $300,000 in aid every nickel back, just like we're supposed to. Never got any grants, can never get allocation of new market tax credits, and those kind of things. But it hadn't stopped us from doing uh, basically about $400 million worth of different kinds of uh, transactions that drove capital into low income areas and primarily to borrowers of color. What's your take on what? This, the CDFI industry is doing, because I talked about it now, it's talking about using that as a channel. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Uh, you went on mute, but I think I, I heard uh, the, the point being that, you know, what what is it that the CDFI a program, you know, what, what are my thoughts on what it's doing and whether it's effective? I mean, I, you know, honestly, uh, I do, I you know, I, I, I'm not, I'm a critic of that as a response. Um, part of it is, you know, this was a Clinton era uh, program uh, and it was based on Shore Bank, uh, Chicago's, uh, you know, Shore Bank. And it was really um, sort of, you know, sold, pitched and sold by, you know, Larry Summers and Andrew Cuomo, who was uh, uh, Clinton's um, uh, HUD secretary as, as basically being, you know, a, a win-win, like the investors will get a profit and the community will get these loans. And it's like sort of niche capitalism. And I think, one of the things that the CDFI, the, the basis of the program ignores is the fact that like black bankers had been doing this work for, you know, a hundred years. And, and the reason why they weren't gaining profits is because of that market disparity. You can't have, um, you know, because of segregation, property values uh, in black communities don't increase the way that they do in white segregated communities. That is just part of the legacy of redlining and that wealth once it's, it's extracted from those communities, banks can't really grow that wealth without sort of um, investments coming in from actual capitalists, right? So actual capital needs to be put, put in. And you see this happening with gentrification. So when, when does uh, uh, you know, wealth come in? It's when outsiders come into a neighborhood with their equity and then those house prices rise and then you're able to see that upswings. And, and the CDFI program really focused on credit without the equity part. Um, there was, there was inducements, tax credits and stuff for banks to set up these programs. There wasn't enough capital, you know? And if you look at the disparity with CDFIs that are black owned uh, in, in those communities, the capital basis is always less. Um, and that's because of this, this legacy and this difficulty in actually growing capital insofar as you have segregation, insofar as property values are embedded with these racial structures. And so I think the, CDF, the CDFI program is, you know, I, I kind of put it as an extension of Nixon's black capitalism. And I, I still think we're in that mindset. The CRA similarly is, is that way. Um, I think the opportunity zones, it's exactly from Nixon's playbook, this idea that you're gonna induce, um, you know, entrepreneurs and capitalists into uh, these segregated black um, spaces that were redlined and disinvested from with tax cuts. So who who is getting that equity? Who is getting that benefit? It's the investor, the capitalist. It's not the community. And so I I, I do think that CDFIs and, and MDIs do amazing work in that they shelter communities when there are things like subprime loans. So black black owned banks, CDFIs didn't get involved in subprime lending. But that's when the profits came. The profits came when Wall Street went looking for high interest loans to, to sell to communities that were deprived of mortgages for, you know, uh, the good mortgages, right? The wealth building mortgages. And so, yes, you do have a win-win and it's a win for Wall Street and another win for the banks. <laughs> you know, it's, it, it was not for the community. You know, the financial crisis wiped out 53% of the wealth of uh, black communities, wealth that has not been recovered. So when we talk about economic recovery, we're not talking about that part. Um, so I, that's a you know long long response, but I I don't think that that's the way to go, and and I think it's, it's especially not the way to go because because it becomes the thing when we talk about the racial wealth gap or when we talk about it just there's like three answers that you just keep hearing and it's CDFIs, microcredit, you know fin fintech. Now now it's fintech, right? So there's these these programs, um, and and I think uh, th that's not it. <laughs> Um, Let me follow it up with the notion that, you know, uh, if you think about how in this country we value ownership, 
of stuff. So to the extent that you could use a tool like the Federal Housing Administration and allow people to line up and get home ownership, mm -hmm. that becomes the basis of building wealth. Mm -hmm. Do you think something like that needs to be instituted again and then targeted Absolutely. directly to those folks who were never, were always at the back of the line and they kept moving the door? Let's put it that yeah. way. That's, that that's, exactly, that's exactly it, because it's like, we know how to create wealth. We did it with the FHA. And the way that you create wealth is create low risk asset growth. And so we did it with guaranteeing mortgages, making a very low interest, right? So it's not subprime credit or just straight up housing grants like the Homestead Act, right? That's how you grow wealth. You grant uh, either uh, the, the property, the home, or a, a product that is like, is fail proof um, wealth expanding. That's the FHA. So that's how the white suburb um, le you know, grows leaps and bounds in wealth is because they get this 30 year fixed rate mortgage and amortize or a certain thing. And you're guaranteeing actually that we have um, manufactured this suburban economy such that you actually like, you're paying less in a mortgage now than you are than the people who didn't get that mortgage in the city. They're paying rent. They don't own it. And we're going to assure that the property values all rise together. Right. So so it is it is we you know, the the negative is that, of course, it that we still have that. Right. Uh, we still have th those people got to keep that. Well, the positive here is that we know how to do it and we've done it before. And now the, the question is, how do we fix it for the people that we keep leaving out every single time? And I do want to be like, let me be a little bit cynical here. I think part of middle-class white wealth is built on the exclusion of uh, black people from their community. And I, I think that that is not, you know, we call it the wages of whiteness, I would say the equity of white homes, um, it, they are higher priced a lot of times because of uh, the exclusion of, of these uh, other communities. And, and, and that is something that is explicit when you look at these zoning um, disputes that come up. And if you look at, you know, the way that the racial covenants were, were built out, I, I still believe that. And then I think a lot of, uh, you know, communities act as though they also know it, that they will protect that um, to, you know, and, uh, you know, uh, they, they, they will protect their, um, that kind of privilege by really fighting any, any of that stuff, because part of it, it's not just the home, right? It's the school funds, right? So we, we fund elementary, and public, all public education through taxes from property taxes, right? And it's local. We draw those lines around our district. And uh, I think people will fight that kind of, not just the integration of people, but the integration of their tax dollars um, to go to other schools. And and I, I uh, you know, do think some of that is changing. The consciousness is, is rising, but here we're, we're just asking people to like not hoard advantages. And that's a hard, thing to ask people are really driven uh in some ways uh, to, to uphold that but but it's possible certainly and this is like policy can do this let me and ask, that is, let me that ask is one more question and then mm -hmm. turn it over but another buzzword that you hear out there i hear a lot of today is community land trust as a mm -hmm. vehicle to deal with this mm -hmm. wealth disparity and intellectually, I don't necessarily understand how that moves the dial. I'm wondering. Yeah. Yeah, I think the community land trust model is, uh, can work when we're talking about just providing affordable housing. It's not equity building, right? By nature, the community owns the land underneath. And so they, they do provide housing, which is a huge you know, uh, help. Um, but in the places where community land trusts have worked, the, the, the equity never gets passed on to the, the people of that place. And so, you know, if, if we're going to change the structure of our economy and not have equity be, be any, you know, like we're going to be community, you know, ownership, if we're going to propose that, then this will work, but we're not people, people own wealth and the community land trust model uh, doesn't pass that wealth on to the community members. Um, not, not in a, a, a negative way. It just, um, uh, that's just not what it's set up to do. It's, it's a very sort of, um, a squishy housing model that is that is for housing and I think it's good and and you know gardens and all of that other stuff comes with it. We had one in Athens, Georgia where I lived and it's a great community space. It just doesn't do much to close the racial wealth gap. Um, so 
I have uh, two questions from our audience. One, and, and this kind of ties in with one of our questions as well, uh, with the merger of Broadway Federal and as well as City First Bank. And the, the question is, uh, your, what are your thoughts on uh, bank Black movement? And is it uh, futile, especially when it comes to Black businesses seeking capital for startup and, and for growth? Uh, so is that our answer? I know that obviously took place in Black Wall Street. Is that mm -hmm. a possibility um, for mm -hmm. that to take place today? Uh, Broadway Federal has been uh, in, the, in our community for a long time. And um, mm -hmm. the a uh, founder of Recycling Black Dollars actually found a, mo a movement, and I think uh, Kevin was involved in that, with moving over 2,000 depositors to, to Broadway Federal in 2000 and bringing in about, um, uh, I think it was about $2 million in, in revenue or something, or, or reserves. So what are your thoughts on that in this merger that's supposed to bring together $4 billion in reserves for the two banks? Yeah. Um you know, the, the more power, the better. I mean, I still think the combined merged bank is, you know, uh, a tiny fraction of like Bank of America's equity. You know, Bank of America is a $3 trillion company. Um, and, and I think this is, this is a great, you know, we, you, there, there needs to be some market power, but it, we're still talking about five banks that control 80% of the market share. So this is not uh, a real threat to that. Um, as far as Bank Black, uh, I really do trace that, I, you know, I have that, that is, was around when I wrote the book and I, you know, quote Killer Mike in it. And I talk about the Bank Black movement, the resurgence post the initial Black Lives Matter marches post um, the Michael Brown um, shooting. Um, I think it is, there are two sizes and this is, you know, traced back, you know, Frederick Douglass to, you know, Carter Woodson to W. Du Bois, um, Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. Like there, there has been Black, Black, Bank Black called obviously different things, but um, you know, there's two sides of this, right? One is like we can, the promise of you can um, control the dollar and keep it in the community and grow it. I, I, I think that that's not, that, that's not quite possible because of the way banks work. That money leaves the second someone purchases an asset from a white person and that's unavoidable. So that, that's sort of one tra track. The other track is Bank Black as boycott and protest. And that is one that has been used. You know, Martin Luther King began and ended his movement. If you look at you know, his Memphis speech with the end of his movement before he was assassinated and the early 1950s um, uh, parts of his movement where you know, he was laying out the agenda for civil rights, it was Bank Black. Essentially take your money out and put it in these black institutions and credit unions. And he was on the board of a, a black bank. And, and part of it was boycott, right? Just like the Sel Selma, uh, the sorry, Montgomery bus boycotts and the marches um, across the South, it was take your money out and just as a show of solidarity. But really the aim is to change policy. And, um, and, and Killer Mike has shown both strands of this, you know, the Bank Black movement also. Killer Mike at first launches Bank Black by saying, you know, take your money out of the dog's mouth. This is a quote, you know, he says like basically as a protest boycott. And, and sometimes he does talk about just the, the, the buying power and, and combining. And one of the hard things about that for me is that it does put the onus on the Black community for a problem that the Black community didn't create. Right, uh, the the you know this idea that if you just bought black and if you just invested and if you use your consumer dollars, you could help fix this gap. And I, and I and I and I think you know um, it, that shifts the risk and the responsibility on to people whose job it is not to fix it. And also, um, it doesn't work because you actually can't you can't control where your money goes in a lot of ways. Like you can bank black, but then that bank is going to be merge, merging those assets into the broader structure. And so insofar as you have these fundamentals, you can put all of your individual energy into making good decisions as a consumer, and then, but at, at one level higher than you, which you don't have power, that money's gonna go away. It's the same thing I think with recycling, right? Like I recycle, um, but if we actually want to fix the environment, we're gonna need you know, to stop you know, doing certain things just globally, like my recycling isn't going to do it. Um, and, and I wouldn't want people to think, oh, well, I recycle, therefore, we shouldn't have climate change policies that are really structural. And I think the same thing here, like, go ahead and bank black, but really like this, the, the problem is structural. And until you fix that structure, um, every single one of us making good decisions isn't going to fix it. 
So it's uh, so, and I, I just recently I was uh, involved in a, a conversation. Um, um, uh, Robert um, Rubenstein on the color of law. He was speaking, and that was one of the things he was saying that uh, one to change is policy. We have to have policy, mm -hmm. and having a civil rights movement like Martin Luther King did is what's going to make that change. He says mm -hmm. we had so. Is that are you in agreement with that? That it has to be policy changes that we have to be striving to reach, and and the black bank, the buy black banks are really just a a band aid on what the real mm -hmm. problems are. Yeah, but you know, and again, but I want to be clear here. Like when Martin Luther King was saying bank black, it was as protest and boycott. So I I I do think that that works. If you want to change policy, you can, um, you know, have movement solidarity and actions to say, look how committed we are. I mean, like the, the he, you know, ending Jim Crow with the Montgomery bus boycott, that was an economic, and he knew like if, if you, if we mobilize and put our finger into one pressure point here, which is the bus system that relies on our money, then, then we can actually get them to pay attention, right? So, uh, you know, I'm not like, I do think there's a way that people can pay attention through these acts of solidarity, um, but that's more, yeah, the aim should be change the policy. The aim shouldn't be um, change our individual behavior to fix this. I, I, I just think generally that's something that uh, policymakers constantly do, which is a decoy. I think when they say, when you say, well, demand this, they're like, well, you should recycle. Or, and I keep coming back to that because that's, that's one that, you know, uh, like as though everyone making bad decisions is the reason we're in this mess, right? And I think that's one of the big myths I'm going at in the book is this idea that it's, you know, because of culture or decision making or not saving enough money, that's why we have the racial wealth gap. And if only you would fix, you know, these individual problems, then we could fix it. And you look at the policy, and you know, these were not. <laughs> the, I mean, it's almost laughable to like. That's not how this works. That that's not how these gaps were created. They were systematic. They were policy based. They were, you know, race like explicitly. Um, racist exclusions and no amount of personal decision making was going to get you an FHA mortgage in 1935, right? And no amount of personal decision making is going to close the racial wealth gap. Um, now, I'm not saying like your personal wealth, like, you know, everyone should go and do the best they can with the money that they have, right? But that's not what, what, what I'm talking about. Wow. Anyone else? I know there's a couple other points here. Redlining obviously is a big issue, and that's what was also in the color of law talks about redlining and the the uh, real specific uh, crafting to prevent us from creating wealth in in real estate. Um, so, uh, anyone, Robin, you want to jump in here with a question? I, I'm so sorry. I, I actually, yeah, yeah. I only yes. spent 15 minutes, so I have a meeting that, that is I'm late for. So I'm very okay. Sorry, well, thank you so run. much. We thank appreciate you. you. Um, you. and uh, thank you. So thank we're you. gonna turn it then over to bye bye. Thank you so much, Robin. We're gonna bring it over, bring you in, and and let you carry on from there. I and I'm sure you've been in banking as long. The name of her book is The Color of Money: Black Banks and the Racial Wealth Gap. You can purchase it on Amazon and it is, and also another book I would suggest you get is The Color of Law. I think the more information we have in this area, uh, not necessarily so that we know how to move forward. We, we uh, and I think she's absolutely right. We can go through the machinations of certain uh, movements, but until we all move it into a right, into a powerful direction that's changing policy and law, then we're going to be where we are. And so with that, Robin, I'm going to turn that over to you because you've been in banking for a long time and you have some very enlightening uh, opinions and directions for us as well. Thank you. You know, I'm grateful for the opportunity to have this conversation, and I think it needs to continue. You know, we talk about business literacy and financial literacy are the two pieces that are missing. And Kevin, you know, Kevin is on. Kevin, I've been watching the chat box. Usually I'm on the chat box too, but I was trying to make sure I stayed focused. Kevin has been talking about, we've been talking about looking at redlining and talking about the, what I saw Kevin say, which is what I truly believe in and which was my success in banking. I spent 30 years in banking, probably 22 years in commercial real estate, construction, financing, learned so much with a journalism degree from Missouri. Michael Brown went to my high school. So, you know, I'm from Missouri. Missouri is just north of the Mason-Dixon line. I've been dealing with racism 65 years old. So, so my contention is this. Let's stop looking in the rearview mirror. 
this education that we just received about the banking industry, about law, we have to continue to have these conversations. We also have to continue to share this information. My success in banking came from the fact that I'm a question asking person. You know, one of my friends said, Robin, stop saying that you're nosy, you're curious. So whatever the, whatever the politically correct word is, you just have to keep asking questions and you have to ask questions until you understand. Because what, because what tends to happen is the person wants to explain it to you and they've done a great job, but if you're not connecting and you're not hearing them, then you really don't receive the information. And so again, red redlining has been in our favor. To a large degree, while it's certainly there is disparity in banking, while it, it's heinous how we've been treated, but when the economic downturn hit, because of redlining, we still had equity in our property. We still had a lot of equity in our property. I live in North Inglewood, North Inglewood, which is now called La Tierra Village, because Anglos have moved into the neighborhood. And, and from that, I live in a community where Inglewood, where people would not buy in Inglewood because that's that old neighborhood. As I tell people all the time, dive into the pool. You go where your money will take you. You have to get into the pool. And part of getting into the pool is owning something, owning real estate. My 30 years plus in banking, what I learned, people with money own real estate. Seniors right now who are surviving is because they own real estate. Yes, there's redlining. Yes, the pricing is not going to be, there's going to be disparities in the way we're being treated. But I think part of what our challenge is, we won't read. We have to read. Correct. We have to read and we have to share because reading is fundamental. Reading gives you some, some foundation to understand, if nothing else, the glossary and the language of an industry. One of the questions that was posed to me is, what role do Black bankers play? Here I am, I spent 30 years in banking, and I basically am out of banking because of racism. But what I did while I was there is made my voice heard, brought a diverse um, 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 view to every situation. Um, I educated, I established trust. I helped to create a roadmap. I, we, we, our mission in life for everybody on this call, because this is our educated group right here, everybody on this call, our mission in life is to bring somebody along. You know, one of the things that I've heard is don't, uh, Bernard Parks always talk, I mean, I'm sorry, Bernard Kinsey always talks about being the first black executive at Xerox. Well, his whole thing is don't use the ladder and bring it up. Use the ladder and send it back down so that someone else can come up. Um, so I think that Black bankers, Black folks in general, bring a diversity of thought and a voice. However, people don't understand their value and um, their branding. You are bringing your value to the table. You are bringing your community to the table when you sit in a, in a financial services in, um, um, sit at the financial services table. Well, here I am, 22 years old, journalist degree, worked a 40 hour job um, while I was in college. And when I came here, couldn't get a job in public relations, fell into financial, fell into a master training program. And when I got to lending, found my space. And in finding my space, let me just say this, at 22 years old, I had a selection committee of 13 white males in San Diego in order to be able to get into the program. So I'm looking at this, this group of folks who are on this call. We all have stripes on our back. We have to share those stories. We have to share those stories, but share them from the per perspective of what resilience did you bring to the table? Whose shoulders are you standing on? And what, who, who do you connect to to help you keep a, a positive thought about that? You know, the other question that was brought to me is does, bank, does having black bankers at some of our larger financial institutions make a difference in serving the needs of our community? Yes, it can, and yes, it can. Some people come to work just to work. They're going there to collect the check. They don't, want to, they don't want to be a rebel rouser. I don't know how to be any other way. I'm a middle kid. I'm from Missouri. I've, I've, I've had to scratch for the apple every, every chance I've gotten. Um, how I got out of commercial real estate, um, I actually turned 50 and said I needed to do something else because I needed to obtain more marketable skills. Every day, we, our job is to obtain marketable skills and share that story with somebody on how to get there. And so with that, yes, I think that Black bankers can make a difference at these large financial institutions. Black folk can make a difference in any environment that they're in. As long as you own who you are, you're comfortable with who you are, you have your tribe and your village that shores you up. And from that, the, next, the, the most important thing is establishing trust, understanding, and, and imparting education. Um, I think that a Black banker can help you understand the conversations around credit. 
What is an appraisal? You know, what are the foundational things around government affairs? It can illuminate the inter intricacies and the ethnical differences that Black people have as a borrower. You know, we, 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 I asked someone, um, as I've been doing this consulting thing, I asked someone, well, have you ever spoken to your business banker? And they looked at me with a question mark on their face. They said, well, I talked to the branch manager. Well, people, banking has changed. We really have an opportunity to participate in the financial services industry because everything is being disrupted. Everything's online. Everything, you know, Google, you, you need to Google any and everything so that you have some foundational understanding of the conversation that you're trying to have with a bank. But I think that this this disruption that we're going through, this COVID-19, while it looks so negative, at the end of the day, it is a fresh start for all of us. It, it truly is a springboard for all of us. And yeah, there's always going to be this, this, these disparities and the, and the um, inequity that goes on. But if you don't raise your hand and say, excuse me, I don't think that that's equitable. I don't use the word fair because fair is where the pigs and hogs are. Life has never been fair for us. It never has been. But we have resilience and we are the surviving race. Um, how can black bankers compete with some black banks compete with some of the larger financial institutions for our banking needs? Again, banking has changed. So because banking has changed and everything's electronic now, we can come, we can get there. But at the same time, too, we have to remember that living here in California, 58 percent of the population is Hispanic. You know, so when people say, well, I just want a black agenda. No, we need a black and a brown agenda. We need a black and Asian agenda because in everybody's family on this call, there's somebody who's mixed race. My grandbabies are, are Jamaican. My, my, my daughter in love says, she told my son when they first met, I'm not black, I'm Jamaican. It's her culture, you know? So we need to look at alliances, creating alliances with the right individuals in order to move this thing forward. I see quite a few of my friends on this call and I appreciate you guys coming on to support me. But look at these names that are on these calls. These are subject matter on this on these calls. And and if you haven't tapped into yep. these individuals, yep. Karen, Karen, Karen A, you're, Karen A, you're not on mute. Karen, Karen A, oh, you're okay. not on mute. <laughs> Um, but there's some there's some subject matter experts on this call that we need to tap into. What generally happens is we are afraid to let someone know we don't know. I'm the first person to say, excuse me, could you start over? Could you start over and, and slow it down so that I can get it? Because my job is not only to get it for me, but to share that information with others. So I think, you know, from a solution standpoint, you know, as he, she just mentioned, the CDFIs are the way that folks are going. Whatever comes up, we need to be actively engaged in that. We need to support a Maxine Waters, who is the chair of the finance committee. You can't tell me that she's not in there slicing and dicing people's butts because that's how she operates. She brings it to the forefront. We have to remember who we elect. We have to be, we have to be advocates. And the final thing that I will say is understand risk. Mimic what, what, when you see success, start, try to mimic that. Make sure you do due diligence. You have to become an advocate. And, and Crystal Mitchell, thank you for these kinds of platforms that you've created for these conversations to be had. Because what tends to happen is people will catch me on the church parking lot. No, that is, that's not where I do business. I don't do business on text. I do business on email because I need a paper trail. I need to be able to make some notes. I need to be able to come back to that conversation. I need to be able to share that information information with someone else. And someone said, well, you know, the young people, I say, yeah, I've been here one day longer than they have or 60 days longer than they have. So, I mean, 60 years longer than they have. So, so the leadership comes from folks who are willing to open up their hearts, folks who have to be receptive to listening. And the most important thing is you have to implement. You gotta do something. You can't, there is no rescue ranger coming to get to rescue us. We have to do something that allows us to take baby steps. And yeah, you know, we've been told, you know, to wait our turn. I've never, I've never accepted that. I've never accepted that. You know, I, I, I we, we talked about earlier about derivatives. One of the reasons why I left conventional affordable housing when I was working in a bank was because they were telling me that I needed to sell derivatives to my clients. And I said, well, 
you haven't explained it to me enough for me to be able to understand it, to explain it, share it with my client who trust me. They trust me to do the right thing. They trust me to take their project in, get it approved for, through credit, get it funded, you know, that type of thing. So I welcome the opportunity to, to continue this conversation around um, banking and what banking looks in the future and what credit looks like, what capital looks like. I, I think one of the things that I found since 2006 when I moved into the diversity space with the supply diversity program that I created for US Bank and then subsequently working for WeBank that certifies women-owned business, Two things that happened for me. One, I've been behind the curtain with a whole lot of Fortune 100 companies. I know how they operate. I know what happens in their supply chain. I know what they're looking for. So when I ask you to do something or tell you to do something, I don't need you to question me. I need you to implement. Because I'm, if you do that step, then I got the next step for you. But what tends to happen is people go and gather up too much information and then they get frozen and they don't move. And they don't move. So again, I, I, I think that it's critical that we all dive into the pool, that we all become bankers, bank, we have a bank menta banking mentality, and that we, you know, yes, we look in the rear view mirror to understand the history, but we do more, more importantly, we do, what do we do with that information? How do we implement on that information? Uh, Karen A. Ashley has a question, and that is- Crystal, you're on mute. Oh. Wow. <laughs> Thank you, Robin. Sure. Yeah, Kevin, you know, your, your comments were, were spot on. I don't, I don't know you. I will. Well, get we're going to get to know one another. No Crystal, question. I just want to say this. Crystal, I have not read the book, but just based on listening to her speak, I was fuming. I'm a stakeholder in the banking industry since the 80s. I know everybody from CRIP to Congress. I've been involved as an advocate for everything, for fighting for, um, the uh, subprime lending at 14.95 and 15 points and then leaving that company to then go work for a commercial bank like Bank of America. Yes, I've been in the community. I was community lending at the Citibank uh, Development Center out there on Jefferson. We had a $500 down loan and couldn't find people to qualify. FHA programs are fabulous, but if people don't know how to use them, or let me talk about real estate broker that I was there. If the agents in the marketplace don't know that those are beneficial tools for them to use, then they still aren't being used. We still have to talk about credit. We still have to talk about qualification. We still have to talk about debt to income ratios and all that other stuff. Who am I? I'm just a guy in the struggle. You talk about the program she mentioned, Midnight Basketball Program. I ran that program for the city of Inglewood. And the problem is, you know you have guys out there that have Fs and they're coming to play basketball under the guys that you're going to help them start a business or get a job. And you know there's no one looking for jobs for guys that have Fs. And there is nobody that's going to lend them any money to start their business idea, regardless of how good it is. So forget about the business plan you're trying to get them to write because you're not going to fund it. It's all about tick points. So I'm fuming as I listen to her. Who am I? I'm just a guy in the struggle. I see opportunity. I do deals. There's a radio station in Inglewood on La Brea because I put them there. I saw Willie sell his business and not the building. The two towers, God bless them today, next to KJLH. I used to run my mortgage company there in the 80s. I took over the buildings to do leasing for them. I then saw Stevie have to move out of Crenshaw and said, don't go to the Motown building. This building's already built out and ready to go. Took it away from a big company, just me. I showed value. Three year lease, they, I got paid. One year later, they bought the building. I got paid. And Robin, like you mentioned, Inglewood, I used to live on Hyde Park off of La Brea, right there for many, many years. Service company and all those guys know them well. Let me ask you what's happening in Inglewood today. Anybody that bought that $85,000 condo on Hyde Park East of Beach. What's it worth today? My mother's house on 109th in Vermont, she bought for $37,000 in 1970. It's worth over $400,000 today. As a broker in 1989, I sold her the house next door for $85,000. I arranged the loan. I arranged the sale. I got all the commission. Put the money back into the deal. Showed her, just trust me. I'll show you how to do it. 
that house my sister lives in today. It's worth 485,000. Two properties right next door worth almost a million dollars that she spent less than $100,000 for. I preach the question of get off the corner doing car washes. I want people to figure out how we keep the legacy. How do we keep, who's in grandma's property today? How do we keep that in the family today? How do we show you how to qualify? Who knows how to put the estate plan together? See, I'm fuming because I have been out there. I know what it's like. And I know we don't have the information. Learn it, do it, teach it. Yeah, that's what I do. We've been out there with RBD, Change Banks. I've been involved with great, uh, with, uh, what's the other one? Golden State Mutual, life insurance guy. I tried to help them before they crashed. Even rebuilt their website, taking them into the future, and they're still gone. I'm happy to hear what's happening with Broadway Federal. Used to work with Broadway Federal, even, doing mortgage lending for them. No, I am in the struggle. I've been quiet these last several weeks on this call, but this young lady has got me filming, and Crystal, please believe I'm coming back to you and Robin, and we're going to find a way to put this message out there because I've got an economic empowerment way to help fix the treasury. How about $500 credit for every employee you have working for you? How about $16,000 worth of uh, retirement value for each employee, whether they use it or not, each year? See, I got stuff. I'm going to be very disruptive. I've been in Vegas. Why did I get here? I saw Wachovia. Agreed to be purchased by Wells Fargo Bank in November 1989. How do I remember? I resigned in December 1989. I left and I came to Vegas and I've been here ever since. People, we have to come together. We have to get the information in the community. And I've been in the struggle. I'm not going anywhere. I'm just getting ready to come out in a big disruptive way. And I need everybody's help. Right now, I need 10 insurance agents that I can partner with right now before the end of the month. I'm just asking for it. It is not cost you anything. If you do anything with healthcare, we need to get this stuff that I have to the community because it's very much needed. It's healthcare, it's benefits, and we need to secure those benefits now. Hey, that's my soapbox. I don't do it normally, <laughs> but today she got me livid. Crystal, you're not, you're on mute. Um, I don't know why I'm on mute. Uh, let's see. Um, but let me unmute. Can you hear me now? We're, we can't hear you. Your voice is distant. Really? Okay, hold on. Very distant. Let me, let me put this Turn the headset on. Okay, can you hear me now? Well, you know, and to Kevin's point, you know, I think what's, what's most critical is we have to make sure it's just like um, we always know we got to bat a thousand. If, if the other folks have to bat 100, we have to bat a thousand. So part of batting 1000 is, is to get ready mode. You know, are you, have you done your due diligence? Have you put your affairs in order? Do you have the proper tools? And if you don't, are you asking for that help and, and that support? You know, I sat on PCR's loan committee almost 40 years ago. I was pregnant with my son, Ken when I got on that loan committee. Again, that's an organization that's been around forever. I see my god sister, Karen A. Clark. She has taken City National Bank, um, which was a Jewish owned bank, highly high net worth sports entertainment folks. She's come on board as a multicultural marketing strategist. She's an excellent banker. But the but what I, what I love about her is a, she has a voice. She's willing to help. She's willing to share. We have Marissa here who just graduated from the Ross program at USC, the Minority Program of Real Estate Development. Again, there are tools and resources out here. We just have to plug into them. And because everything is electronic now, you don't have to worry about what time do you, you, do you set aside for your pro, uh, professional development. You just have to set some time aside to do that and, 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 and take care of that and be, and be consistent with it. One of the things that I heard on Urban View earlier this week is we don't consistently vote. We voted for Clinton, we voted for Obama. So, you know, in between there, what do we, we didn't vote down ballot. We, you know, we have to have some consistency. And so again, I know our time is well spent, but look at the names and the folks that are on this call, reach out to them because these, this is an excellent resource call here. Carlton Jenkins, you know, I, I'm looking at these names of these historical folks, Deborah Watson. I'm looking at these people that I know that I can honestly say, 
This um, Miss Bobecki, this that you see up here, Bianca, woman-owned business, fantastic, award-winning woman-owned business. These are the individuals that you need to touch bases with. And, and Crystal, again, thank you for providing a platform for us to have these kinds of conversations and for the connection to be made. And, and, and can you guys hear me now? Uh-oh, we can't hear you again. Dang, damn it. Can you hear me? No, I don't hear you. Can you hear me? No one can hear me? Still, your voice is so distant. Can you guys hear me now? A little better, okay. but, but still distant. Yeah, I can't hear anything at all. You're now completely muted, Crystal. Mm, you just lips are talking. Pick the headphones back up. This is what I call Satan Joy Stiller. You know, we, 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 we got this great conversation going, this great dialogue going, and this connection is happening. And this is, and, and the, the, that universe is mad. But don't, don't be so mad that you don't vote. You guys see my, my AKA uh, vote t-shirt here? What's yeah, it's really great. Crystal and I said earlier today, the most important thing that we need to be doing right now is everybody on this call need to make sure 10 people vote and complete that census. Those two things right now is what we have to focus on because getting, a, you know, growing a bag, black bank, have getting access to capital, it's all about who we put in office. And I think that people are starting to realize these touch points of, <sighs> I'm hoping that they're starting to, to understand that how you vote, who you advocate for, who you support is where, who and where you're gonna go and where you're gonna be. Well, Satan didn't steal too much joy because we've had a fabulous, fabulous conversation. And I know everybody on this phone is fired up. Yes. So thank yes. you all for putting it together. He didn't steal too much joy because he waited an hour too late to uh, start to try to wreak havoc. We've yep. gotten the information now. Yeah. <laughs> thank you all. Thank you all. I, this is Karen A. Clark with City National Bank. I put my email on the chat and I'm available uh, for anything anybody needs. Paulette Moore is on the line. I'm the, she is the director of um, Pacific Coast Regional Small Business Development Center, which Robin mentioned she was on loan committee. I'm the treasurer of that SBDC. We're available. And the thing about information is if we just had it and we disseminated it, see, this is the charge folks. For those of us on this phone, you have a responsibility. You can't sit on this call and then leave and not tell somebody about this information or try to reach somebody that was on this call to continue this discussion, right? Because we have a vision and the book of Habakkuk says you have to tell your vision. And so we've all got to continue this conversation. I thought this shine would be gone long ago, but see God is on our side. Yes, and for those of us who have this information and knowledge, sometimes we take it for granted, but I'm telling you, people need us. They need us because while we are hoping and waiting and pushing our elected officials to do something, we have a responsibility to do something. You guys, and so I'm yes. really pleased to be here and thank you all, all you speakers. Um, and uh, it has been great. You guys, Crystal, I'm, I'm gonna close this out for Crystal, but again, she does this every Thursday and every yeah. week there are some exceptional presenters and some exceptional conversation that goes on. You know, again, and we need all of you guys, any, any industry that you're in, we need your voice, we need your support, we need your insight, we need your guidance. And so again, I want to thank you guys on behalf of Recycling Back Black Dollars, on behalf of Crystal Mitchell, who is a fighter. If you, if you really want to know how she fights, every now and then, look at her Facebook posts. <laughs> Sometimes you think she got fire coming up out of top of her head, but it's so needed. It's so very needed. So again, you guys, thanks again. I, you know, I, my, my email is very simple, rmvillas at outlook.com. I look forward to talking to you. And again, gratitude is a memory of the heart. Let's keep making great memories. Absolutely. Take care, be well, and stay black. <laughs> All right, take care, everybody. Good evening. <laughs> Have a great weekend. All right, See you next take week. care now. Bye-bye. Thank you for the information.